Hello and welcome. I want to thank you for joining me. Today I want to talk about the great unfinished myth of the West. And this topic came to me by Mr. Henry Corbin, one of my most favorite authors and thinkers. I mean, I really like Henry's work. He's an incredible person, a Frenchman who spent a lot of time in the Arab world. And Henry Corbin is the one who came up with the idea of the imaginal world. In other words, a world different from fantasy, a world of imagination that springs out of a divine connection. And that's how I understand it. And Henry Corbin is also a, a man who, in addition to his writings on Sufism, which is a very interesting stuff, wrote about the Holy Grail. And in fact, the last 15 years of his life, Corbin wrote extensively on the Grail and the Grail myth. So it's his contention that the Grail myth is the unfinished myth of the West. And that was picked up by some other people very early on. And that myth was also picked up on by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who speaks very lovingly and eloquently about the castle of the Grail, along with another very influential man, Shurawardi, who was a Middle Ages Sufi thinker and a man who was put to death for his heresies. And his hymns on the castle of the Grail and the guardians of the Grail are really fabulous pieces. So I'm urging you to kind of do a little bit of study on the Grail myth and what it has for us today as, a, as an idea which is about to unfold. I think in much greater efficacy than it has in the past. It has not yet gripped humankind in the way that I think is its destiny. And in that destiny, I think we find our, our future. And that's what I want to concentrate on is the future. That's really something that is the most interesting to me. I understand the necessity to kind of live our history and, and learn from it. I get that. But where we're going is the future. And it's, a, it's going to be a rocky ride, as we all are experiencing. Another way to understand it, if you have some sympathies with astrology, that the age of Pisces is coming to an end. And the age of Aquarius is going to be, going to be with us. Now, the time frame of that is a little uncertain in terms of its actual realities. But thinking about that, it, it allows for the possibility that something new is going to happen. It's really going to happen. It's going to be with us in force because it is the portents of the creation, the majesty of interlocking gravities and all sorts of plays of energy and of psychic realities that we barely can understand. But I want to stay with the idea of the grail and the grail myth because in, in it, there is something pretty spectacular. And of course, the central aspect of the grail myth is the grail itself, the holy grail, where we come with the chalice to celebrate Christ's last supper. And in that celebration, there is the internal work of the cup, which we all understand pretty well, is the body and blood of Christ. But there is the cup itself. And I think the cup, to me, represents imagination, divine imagination. And that's where the grail myth begins to unwind or unfold in a way where humankind gets to participate in it. Because we are called in the grail myth and in the power of the grail itself to excite and ignite our imaginations, what's happening is we become part of the future. We are the unfolding of the grail myth. It's us. 
we're doing it. And that myth and the myth of the castle is a really powerful myth. So I also want to introduce Margaret Barker, who is a really wonderful scholar who specializes in First Temple theology. Just a brilliant woman, and I've had the pleasure of meeting Margaret, lightly corresponding with her, and she's quite an extraordinary human being. And her essential thesis is, is that the life of Yeshua was devoted toward really the reconstruction of the First Temple. And I find that and her, her academic research in the subject to be incredibly compelling. So I urge you to go have a look at Margaret Barker's stuff. It's really quite remarkable. And uh, she writes densely, but, but very, very formidably. So I like Margaret's stuff a lot. But Margaret talks about the restoration of the temple. And in my mind, it also means the restoration of the temple or the castle of the grail. And as I said, Shirawardi writes on the the guardians of the castle of the grail, Imago Tempi. And Solzhenitsyn writes of the same idea, Imago Templi. Fascinating stuff. And so a lot of us have been thinking, well, where are we going to go? What's our narrative going to be in these years? It seems as though many of the narratives, the things that we think about as our intellectual fermentation seem to have lost their their potency. The yeast is no longer doing its work to make beer. And what I'm suggesting is, is that it's time to begin to look anew with regards to the narrative that we're going to be exploring and understanding and being part of. And I think the Grail myth is one that can be very fruitful for that purpose, as we understand ourselves as guardians of the grail and of the grail castle. And I want to introduce one more thing, and that is, well, who do you think lives in the castle? Who might that be? Well, I've thought about it a lot, and what springs to my mind and what comes into my vision is Revelations 12. And that is the text which regards the woman clothed with the sun and her son who rules with an iron rod. And therein, I think, is the place to begin to understand the nature of the grail myth as it unfolds from different places as it comes together. One of the things that Henri Corbin or Henri Corbin says in his work on the grail is, is that it's really impossible to pickaxe back into the history of the grail, to come back to Parsifal and the stories of the grail, whether they arrive from Germanic or Teutonic Knights, or whether, you know, where, where do they come from? Well, at some point, Corban says, we don't really need to know that. We need to understand that we, we are the myth now. We are embodying the myth of the grail and its embodiment in the expansion of the cosmos. So there's a lot of opportunities here to introduce new characters, ones that come from places that are not necessarily so ancient, but ones that show up importantly. So I'm going to give you another name that's pretty interesting in this same sort of screenplay of characters that find themselves, in my mind, being on the stage as the, the grail myth unfolds in its fullness, and we begin to understand who occupies the castle of the grail, who gets to drink of the grail cup, who drinks of the body and blood, how does that all play together in the evolution of humankind in the restoration of this earth? Because I think that's part of our, our mission. We are not here just to wait to get to heaven. We are here with a mission, with a calling. And Yeshua certainly made that clear 
in his basic walking the countryside to give, deliver his message of redemption and also of a cosmic understanding of who we are and how we got here. And it's important that we stay with that, that we not give up on that to return to pietistic expositions of our world, to understand how to, you know, find a monastic world. But what I'm talking about is a, a restoration of this earth in a way that's in concert with the unfolding of the galaxy. So I think we get into issues of space and time where we are, in fact, already reenacting time. We are recounting the Christmas celebrations. We are recounting each Sunday a, an incredible act in the, in the rites of communion. So we are beginning to engage time in these ways that are very powerful. And I want to take us back to another time, pre-time, where another event occurred that's not very well known, and I'm not even sure that I am grasping the totality of it, but is the emergence of Barbello. And I would love for you to have a look at Barbello, who was the first emanation that came into the cosmos. So Barbello was neither male nor female, androgynous perhaps, I think. But Barbello emanated. And that fact of emanation is something that I think we should really in embrace and, and take into ourselves, that we are part of an emanation. Yes, we are created, but we create not in a transcendent sense, but in a sense of a emanation of creation. And in that emanation, we are not existing in a world where we're here, heaven's there, and things happen up there, and then they come down here. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that the cosmos is all around us, and the beings of the cosmos are right here. They're right in front of us. And we get to immerse ourselves in them and they in us as we form a, a concert of divine beings and of those who have separated themselves from the divine. And they are working their will on us in this material world, in this ordinary reality. They are working their will. And our job, our calling in the fulfilling of the edict of the cosmic expansion is to expand the cosmos without them. In the Torah, it says, hate evil. So think about that for a second. It's not about ignoring it. It's not about, you know, pretending it's not there. It's an active, an active thing, hating evil. And we see evil all around us, and it's important to hate it. Not to just poo-poo it and say, well, it'll go away or whatever, because it's not. It's not going away. It's getting bigger and stronger, and it's amassing unto itself more resources, more energies, and more beings that have been swept up in the illusions of evil. And I'm saying, no, we got to say no to that. There's a no. I don't like you. I don't like evil. I want to be part of the expansion of the cosmos and find my calling in the divine hierarchy, which is how we rise, how we rise in light. And that's what Shorawardi's hymn is, to be beings of light. O God of light, he says. So look into Shurawardi. Find out why was he martyred at 38, a most brilliant man. Because he wasn't a conformist. He didn't adhere to doctrine. He stepped away a little bit to take another gaze, another work. He did something different. He saw emanation. 
beings of the cosmos emanating around us all the time. And he said, okay, I see this. I see that we are the guardians of the castle. We inherit the temple. We are part of it. The grail is for us, for our stake in this world. So why would there be a temple if there's no stake? There's no place to put it. And where we put it is here on this planet, on this earth. And this is where we are to do our work, to be in the light, to bring forth enlightenment as it finds itself around us, to be redemptive, to take hold of the castle and to reinforce it and to defend it and to expand the territories of the righteous. So that's the kind of work that I see for us in the future. I don't see us as ideological as such. I think the ideological realities are certainly with us and we see the panoply of, of that work around us and it's very disturbing, it's very corrupt and it's disingenuous and it's just a bunch of lies. But in fact, that reality is a reality that exists and it's important to us to me, to understand it in the context of the grail and the work of the grail and understand how the imagination that we are given in celebration of the grail is the component which brings us to the restoration of this earth that I think is so powerful. And it's a gateway to us to then make our journey to the other side, to the unseen world where the beings of the unseen world will welcome us as we are citizens of the cosmos and of the divine hierarchy. So thank you for paying attention. I know it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of research. Didn't give you any footnotes. Sorry. You know, there's no links in the footnotes. You know, find these people. Find Margaret Barker. Find Henri Gauban. Find Shirawardi. Go back and look at Solzhenitsyn. Find out who Barbello is. Look in the scripts of the Nag Hammadi library and, f and find Barbello. There's not a lot there, but, but there's enough to, to get your imagination going of this being who arrives and arrives in the mid-story, just like so much of the Grail myth. It, it doesn't, again, start in one little dot and then go here. It starts and then and there's a lot and then there's more. And it, it's, it's in a, a way to understand that's beyond time as such as a linear device. There's more to it than that. So I ask you to join me in the remembrance of that in the creation of the future. Amen.